In 2019, Senator Ted Cruz predicted something that honestly sounds kind of awesome. Pirates threaten the open seas, and the same is possible in space. Apparently, he thought that we needed to create a new branch of the military to fight pirates in space. The U.S. Space Force. Okay, it sounds like some silly science fiction, but is there a chance that Ted Cruz is actually onto something? If space really is the next frontier of commerce, does that also mean that space is the next frontier of piracy? And if so, are they hiring? Pirates have been around for thousands of years. The earliest accounts of piracy go all the way back to ancient Egypt in the 14th century BC. Here's a letter to Amenhotep III. It's from the ruler of a nearby kingdom, and he's complaining about pirate raids. But usually when we think of pirates, we don't think of ancient Egypt. We usually think of something with more swashbuckling. Kind of like this. Never mind them galley knives, chopping them cutlasses. Yes, sir. Lots of stout seamen among them. They've been with us a long time. We can none of us live forever, Mr. Boyle. Dead men don't talk. Man your own, we got this job to do before high tide. <laughs> These are all tropes from the so-called golden age of piracy, which lasted from around the 1650s to the 1720s. As England, France, Spain, Portugal, and the Dutch Republic colonized the rest of the world, they began an unprecedented movement of the world's wealth, and almost all of it traveled by sea. Ships carrying vast amounts of gold, spices, sugar, cotton, and all other kinds of raw materials left the colonies for Europe. Ships carrying manufactured goods sailed to Africa and North America and other colonies, and ships carrying enslaved Africans sailed to the New World, where slaveholders forced them to extract more raw materials that were loaded onto ships and so on. Every single one of these ships represented an opportunity for plunder. During this era, men like Henry Morgan, William Kidd, Edward Blackbeard Teach, and Calico Jack Rackham became notorious for their exploits. So did a small number of women like Mary Reed, Anne Bonny, and Grania Whale. One expert estimated that during the height of the Golden Age, there were at least 10,000 pirates. They were all over the world, ambushing merchant ships at safe harbors and ports where laws were loosely enforced. At one point, pirates even established their own country, sort of. After British governance in the Bahamas collapsed in 1704, a group of more than 500 pirates declared a Republic of Pirates in Port Nassau. Many of these pirates had been given something called a letter of mark, which meant that they were authorized by a government to rob ships operated by hostile countries. Technically, this made them privateers, but only in the eyes of the country that issued the letter. To everyone else, they were still just pirates. You could say it's an arbitrary distinction. But when those letters of mark expired, many former privateers simply continued doing what they did best. Pirating. Piracy's golden age ended as the British began to dominate the seas. Eventually, the Royal Navy had enough ships to patrol coastlines and protect their convoys from theft. The Republic of Pirates was toppled in 1718 by three of His Majesty's warships. Many of the pirates on the island were then captured and sentenced to death. Facing vanishing safe havens and rising odds of being captured and forced to walk the plank, many pirates had their timbers shivered enough to make them give up the lifestyle. But piracy never went away, not completely. Wherever there are valuable things being moved from one place to another, there's always a chance that someone will want to steal them. As with any type of crime, the conditions for piracy appear wherever people have a motive, the means, and an opportunity. If you need a modern example, take a look at Somalia. Somalis have been dealing with decades of civil war, collapsing government institutions, and illegal overfishing by powerful foreign companies. Although the many conflicts in the country have a myriad of underlying causes, corporate exploitation and climate change are among them. In a country where, in addition to war and violence, millions of people will have to deal with starvation 
because of climate change and its impact on drought patterns. A changing climate actually helps fuel armed conflict by increasing tensions between clans that are fighting for crucial resources and making it easier for powerful warlords to recruit young people that are dealing with food insecurity and few job prospects. Food and water are scarce, but there's no shortage of guns. That's the motive and the means. And when it comes to the opportunity, we just have to look off the coast of Somalia where about 15% of the world's container ships pass through the Red Sea. It's not hard to see why many Somalis have taken advantage of the opportunity to hijack one of the many ships sailing past their coast each day. The good news, at least for shipping conglomerates and the people that work for them, is that piracy off the coast of Somalia declined sharply beginning in 2012. This is largely because of a sustained effort by the navies of 34 countries to patrol the region, along with the European Union and NATO forces. The bad news is that many Somalis still have the motive and the means for piracy. It's only their opportunity that's been suppressed. If illegal fishing continues, piracy will almost certainly return to Somalia the moment those warships patrolling the Arabian Sea are needed elsewhere. So does that mean that Ted Cruz is right about space pirates? If we have a spacecraft carrying valuable things, like precious metals from asteroids, do we have to worry about a gang of spacefaring swashbucklers forcing their way aboard? I mean, no? It's not that it's completely out of the realm of possibility. But if you had enough money to compete with the $17 billion the US Space Force requested for its 2022 budget, you'd get more bang for your buck spending your money elsewhere. For starters, you could spend a few hundred million dollars to track drought patterns with satellites to help Somalians and other people who are suffering from the effects of climate change. A more realistic space pirate scenario might involve hacking a spacecraft and issuing commands to it. After all, that is how many of our pieces of equipment we send into space are controlled. This is something that the US military is legitimately concerned about, and they're asking civilians for help. In 2021, the Air Force hosted a hack a sat competition, in which eight teams competed to detect and patch vulnerabilities in a satellite system. This is a potentially dangerous problem. Many satellites have limited memory and processing speed, and they're not built to withstand malicious attacks. Last year, a cybersecurity doctoral student at Oxford University figured out that he could use a TV satellite dish to intercept internet data from in-flight airline passengers, which should be yet another reason to not cyberstalk your ex on that flight home. More troubling was an announcement in 2019 that NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory was hacked the previous year. Apparently someone, NASA says they don't know who, connected a Raspberry Pi computer to NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory servers and was able to breach NASA's sensitive deep space network. The space agency says that the hackers weren't able to issue commands to space assets like the International Space Station, but that's only because officials realized what was going on and disconnected them. So if you wanted to know how to become a space pirate, for the foreseeable future, the answer is study cybersecurity your skills would be much needed. There's lots of valuable minerals, elements, and other resources in space. It's possible that one day an ambitious space entrepreneur or a resource-hungry nation will establish a distant mining operation to recover and utilize those valuable resources. But at the moment, we're a long time away from spaceship truckers hauling expensive shipments of space rocks back and forth. When people ask Elon Musk to explain the business case for establishing a human settlement on Mars, he doesn't talk about loading raw materials on spaceships. Instead, he wants to sell stuff that weighs almost nothing and moves at the speed of light. He believes that a Mars colony will be a pressure cooker for innovation. He also believes that the only economic exchange between a Mars colony and humans here on Earth would be in the form of intellectual property. Innovating and developing advanced technology is one of the many benefits of space exploration. Space is such a difficult place to operate in. Scientists and engineers are constantly pushed to develop cutting-edge solutions to new challenges. NASA's work in space has already given us digital cameras, GPS, 
and even the super comfy memory foam on your mattress. Space travel breeds innovation by necessity. Maybe a SpaceX Mars colony will come up with some really amazing innovations or insights. After all, we developed digital cameras because we needed to take reliable pictures in space. And surviving life on Mars will no doubt ask for even more of us. Past experience shows that it could be anything. Do-it-yourself surgery kits, spaghetti trees, microscopic cleaning robots, or we could find ways to extend and improve the quality of human life. Find a way to generate almost endless clean energy or even expand our understanding of quantum physics. Only time, human ingenuity and luck will tell. If a private entity does come up with a brilliant idea innovation, there is one thing we can bet on. They're going to look to profit off of it. Either directly by packaging a product or securing a patent, or indirectly by the perceived increase in their company or organization's value. A future in which tech entrepreneurs hold exclusive rights to powerful intellectual property wouldn't be too far off from our current reality. Steve Wozniak and Stephen Brandt had a famous public discussion at the first Hackers Conference in 1984 about the tension between information wanting to be both free and expensive. Wozniak was critical of the idea that companies could essentially hide away information if they decided not to take an engineer's idea to market. NASA's public-funded space Space exploration has led to technologies that have changed the world several times over. As the new technologies hit the street as a result of the current era of private space exploration, I hope we won't need Robin Hood hacker space pirates to liberate life-changing technologies from a corporate server. Though I'd probably go see that movie. For more videos like this, subscribe to this channel right now and hit that notification bell so you don't miss any great content. And look out for a curiosity stream on social media. Links in the description.